Hiya, we're Ali and Danny from the Virgin Marys, and you're listening to Word Up Rock and Roll Stories. Welcome to Word Up Rock and Roll Stories with Mike B. In-depth conversations with the world's best singers and musicians. Sponsored by the Waterloo Music Bar, Blackpool, Small Venue, Massive Attitude. Oh, 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 oh. And welcome to episode two of Word Up Rock and Roll Stories, featuring Ali and Danny, who collectively are the Virgin Murrays. A band that have been around for ten years, were once riding on the crest of a wave after receiving critical acclaim for their debut album, King of Conflict, supported some amazing artists like Slash and Shinedown, toured America four times, recorded their second album, Divide, with the producer of their choice, Gil Norton, only for their world to come crashing down around them when their record label was retired by its parent company and bassist Matt Rose left the band. Ali and Danny decided to go down the DIY route and manage and fund the band themselves, the outcome being the Virgin Murray's third album, Northern Sun Sessions, the best to date and my album of 2018. Danny was kind enough to invite me into his home in Macclesfield to hear their story. album Northern Sun Session because it is an outstandingly good album. Oh um, cheers mate, thank you. Um, it was released in November last year and you must be so proud of it. Yeah definitely, I think this one more than um, any of the others because um, we we just did it all ourselves, we did you know from what we've learned in the last say 10 years and took on the production and um, you know, finding engineers and uh, mixers and masters, and um, it was it was a completely new experience. Mm. So, kind of thought, I don't know. It, it was it was really scary thinking, wow, this is going to be reviewed like the the last albums and what if it's you know like a four hour ten type of mm. you know a marked kind of. But I think I don't know. It feels. Mm. It feels a lot fresher than uh, than it's been for a, for a long time, and it almost feels like there's a rebuild and new fans coming on, and um, a lot of people have said it's a step up from what we've done previous, and um, it's just a very very proud. Yeah, I think it was probably a lot to do with like there was no pressure with it. We didn't really know what we were going to do. I mean, originally we were talking about. Um, I think we had about six or seven songs that were sort of rough ideas that had that had been there before, they never quite got on the the last record, Divides, and but um, we There's a couple it. of songs, sorry interrupting, that's been around for a while, like Northern Sun. Yeah. Northern Sun Northern has, Northern yeah. Time, hasn't it? That, nearly, it? that was going to be on the album for the, the previous one. Mm. Um, I can't remember, it was Gil on it, I think Gil was kind of like, there's another song similar, so he said, you've either, you've either got to have that one or that one on it. Right. And similar with a couple of others, but he, I remember him sort of saying like, you know, these aren't B-sides, these are, you know, don't yeah. form as B-sides. They were more kind of ideas though, I think at that point, and it's just, you know, which ones you develop and which ones you don't. I think a lot of, you know, writers will have, you know, maybe a hundred ideas floating around at one time, but it just depends which one you kind of focus mm. on and um, tie up mm. pretty much, you know, make into the song. So well, we had we had a lot of kind of ingredients there for a long time, but but it was yeah, and it was kind of like these are the last songs that the fans have never heard. So originally it was kind of talk of like, well, let's just put an EP out, and then that might be it for a while, and we'll go and do something else. And then I guess just from being in the studio, more ideas come about. I wrote a load of other songs, then we had an album. Um, Which studio was it recorded in? We did. Uh, we did. Yes. 
Well, yeah, and no, because uh, we did drums and big guitars in a really cool studio just outside of Matt called The Edge. Um, and then we did the other half just to set up that I've got. Right. So, I mean, that was a completely new experience as well. I was working kind of day and night doing uh, yeah. editing and sending the audio files off to it. I'd never done it before in my life. And uh, we were on a time frame and I almost lost my mind. I, I've never done anything like that. I dropped my hard drive, lost a couple of songs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No and, like, the clock was ticking. Yeah. And because the way it is, you kind of... The um, pre-order was kind of paying for... You yeah. know, the fans had already paid, and it's like, wow, you know, yeah. we can't mess this up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't go so, down the pledge route, did you, for this album? We didn't. We never yeah. have really. We um, it was we, just a pre-order. Yeah. Route. It yeah. sounded like the right thing to do in yeah. the current climate of pledge. pledge I, yeah. I, I really hope that they get it sorted out. Why? It is a fantastic concept. It's great. There's just something gone wrong there that they need sorted out quickly. Yeah, I mean, I know loads of people, loads of mates of mine that have done pledge stuff, and it's been great. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then, yeah, all of a sudden, it's just recently all come out that it's yeah. you know. They'll, really they'll turn it around. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will, yeah. We, we did um, a Sitting Ducks, like the EP. I think we did like signed lyrics and T-shirts and stuff through Pledge, but we've never actually used it as a platform to fund an album. Yeah. Sitting Ducks was the first, the EP was the first time you basically gone on your own, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It was pretty. I was like, as as the title says, you, you were sitting ducks. It, it was a pretty dark oh, yeah. time actually because we uh, we were so used to um, right. You're going to be touring around America. You're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing that. And the label um, folded, and uh, Matt left the band. And it was like me and Dan. And it was a proper kind of crossroads of um, what we're going to do. You know what? We didn't have any of that yeah. anymore we were kind of out of the contracts and it was like wow it was just really scary yeah yeah um, but we knew that and how long did that go on for before you realised you knew what you wanted to do I think it was uh, well <laughs> yeah <laughs> still there I think, yeah. Yeah. I think it was just because we, we were still sort of tied into a lot of stuff so we, it felt like our hands were tied right but we we you know what it's like in this day, in, in this day and age now if you the minute you're quiet for six months you you kind of dead, you know. Mm. Um, so I think we just sort of knew we had to put something out just to sort of keep things going. And um, I don't know, it just felt like sort of putting the EP out and um, waiting to get out of certain deals, waiting to get out of certain things. And um, I don't know, I think it's just the response really since then from the fans and stuff is the is the reason that we've probably carried on going. I mean, You've got a very, know, very strong fan base. Yeah. We were at a point, I think, this time last year where it was like, let's just get these songs that the fans haven't heard. Or, you know, let's get what we've got um, at the minute out to the fans and then let's just give it a breather, you know, for a while. But I don't think we anticipated how well um, it would go. Mm. And then other people have come on board to say, you know, we'll book you some tours and we'll, we'll do this yeah. and that. And it kind of feels like a bit of a... Um, you know, like you're starting again, really. Into, so yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's weird. Like, like I say, it, it's mainly it's just it's really the, the uh, response from the fans, really, because one of the mad thing is when you when you do start trying to do it on your own, you do find a lot of doors that maybe would have been open to in the past. They don't want to deal with you because it's kind of like you're doing it on your own, which is sort of against the. I guess against the club if you know what I mean yeah, yeah. so you know doing your own trying to book your own gigs or just trying to get certain things a lot of the doors just get closed on you so it's I don't think a lot of people like to deal with musicians directly either mm. do you know what I mean because they can't be uh, they, can't they can't probably be, they be can't honest can't you as much <laughs> well probably not no you know and um, they're not going to say they're more likely to say to a manager you know we're not doing that, that song's crap or that, yeah. uh, you know, when they'll do it for 100 quid type of thing, That's, rather they're not going to say that to your face. And No, exactly, but if you were still with a record label, you wouldn't have made an album as good as Northern Sun Sessions. I don't think we would have been allowed to make it. No, exactly. It. Um, which is, again, I think that's one of the things that um, I love most about this record. Like, um, one of the things on all the, the previous two albums, as great as they are, yeah, you know, exactly. they're amazing. 
I, I always used to say I preferred Al's voice um, on the demos that he'd done at home in his own bedroom to how the the, the final one. I don't know why. I just I just always did. So on this record, it was like you've got to do all the vocals in your bedroom. So you know that was one of the things we spent. We got some money together. We bought a really decent mic, and then all the vocals on that on that album is all done in Al's bedroom. And yeah. I, I think to me that the that the best sounding was a detached house. It luckily is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because your vocals at the end of all fall down. Your neighbours wouldn't have been happy That's at that. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you had me stand outside to test it, didn't you? Like, just see if you can. Oh, hear it's it. embarrassing <laughs> because like, if you've got no concept of like what's if it's just some guy in a bedroom with that screaming going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all you can yeah. hear. You'll get the uh, three headphones. As long as they think, as long as they know it's me and not. <laughs> That's someone who got tied up in there. I, mean, I, I love a good vocal in a song. I mean, one of my favourite songs is Gimme Shelter for the female vocal in that yeah, song. It totally. is one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. And your vocal in All Fall Down, it just blew me away. Well, it's funny you should mention Gimme Shelter, actually, because you listen to it, it's like a beautiful recording, and you, but you listen to it now, and a lot of it, it's loose and it's maybe out of time here and there and mm. it's, um, it's a bit out perfect. of tune and it, yeah it's perfect and it's in its own because there's no really there's no such thing as perfect and it's um, but now music is just yeah, you auto-tuned know, you with it, and um, yeah. it's kind of you've got the the grid and like snares and move to make it kind of um, you know perfectly in time and perfect we we didn't do any of that with this album um and we didn't use any kind of auto tune. We didn't tweak anything like that. So it's kind of it sounds great sonically, but it's very raw in, a, yeah. in another sense, which um, we probably wouldn't have got away with otherwise. And also, I think when me and Dan first met um, and first started jamming, it would be because there's so many influences going on. Um, the idea that the songs would be doing something, but then they'd go into something completely different, and um, there's quite a lot of that going on in Northern Sunset. Like it's almost like two songs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. Though. Yeah, we I used to do that, that when we first when we first started writing, and then you know you you get involved with producers and labels, and it's like, look, this isn't coherent. Um, you need yeah. to focus on the hook or the whatever. But this was like more you know this is what we think and this is what we feel and somehow it's translating better than it ever has to to fans yeah. and and certain um other media outlets who have kind of said this is definitely the best work that you've ever done yeah, it is i didn't so. think you could you could get better than king of conflict because i love that album so much yeah but it is it's better yeah oh, cheers man yeah nice one man yeah. nice one. What, what was it like not working with a producer then because obviously they would have some in, you worked with toby jepson and gil Norton. yeah they would have had some input it was really scary but it's kind of 50 maybe 40 percent scary 60 percent. i thought it was amazing yeah. because uh <coughs> i know dan was like i'm a massive fan of uh dan's drumming um and he's probably always been told to maybe calm certain things down, but I was like, no, put more in, put more fill, you know, like, and it's like, that's ridiculous. That's, uh, it's like, no, put it, and it's kind of just what you want. That, that's what Danny is when he's live, and it's what, yeah. just n- try to, like, calm none of that down. And Yeah, um, I think that's the thing. It, there's, there's loads of stuff on this album that if we had worked with somebody else, it wouldn't have got on the album, mm. it would have been changed because... I don't know. You, you know, when you have a producer, you have to take um, you have to take diction and take their advice. Otherwise, what's the point of being there? So, yeah. um, less chefs, I guess. You know, I think that's, I think that's like, always sometimes been. We a bit learned hard, like but... an incredible amount on the way, and it wouldn't have been possible had we not worked with the people that we've worked with. Mm. But I think something will get to a certain point that it's good enough, and then it just becomes subjective it becomes into people's preference you know everything is subjective yeah. everything in yeah. the world is subjective yeah yeah but some of them it's are, got to have the skeleton you know it's got to kind of be like you say you work with Gil Norton so you can't get any better than yeah. having Gil Norton yeah absolutely an absolutely I mean that was um, you know that came about really because we'd worked with a couple of, of, of other guys and it hadn't really worked out and then the label just said right the three of you go away and just 
write a list of your favourite who you'd love to work with so we just went through all our old record collection and was like which of our favourite albums yeah. and we all had we all had Gilmore like Pixies Blue Fighters yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was like a Gomez album as well that, yeah, um, Gomez, yeah. I remember me and my brother would listen back in the days where you actually spent the night you know listening to an album fully and um I love that debut Gomez album. Yeah, well, there's one that, like, uh, Gilded, I think, in, uh, I don't know, 2006 or something like that, and we were, um, I probably got the year completely wrong, but just the how clear it was and how it kind of came out of the speakers and how it's like, who's who's produced this? And it just stuff like that and colouring the shape and the Pixies uh, records. And yeah. I think, again, with uh, with Dan's drumming, I always want to hear exactly what he's doing, um, and Gil's just got that amazing way of I don't know um, whether it's layering or it's not muddy or you know you can hear yeah, the in, intricate uh, yeah. kind of patterns of stuff it was just, I think it was just really interesting to see how it worked as well like it was completely different to how we did the first record like yeah. I, I think pretty much all my drum tracks I think were done after midnight and it was only me Gil and, and Gil's engineer um, whereas previously it always we'd always be doing it with the band the band would be in there listening to what I'm doing mm. um, so it was just interesting to see how how he worked you know and, um, I think that I think that probably helped us as well with this record you know we took I think Al probably took a lot from the uh, working with Toby and how he produced the first record and then bits of how Gil produced the second record and you know um, the production, the production on the latest album is is outstanding Oh, cheers! Yeah. But, I mean, it's you need, like you need to outsource yourselves. Yeah, yeah. I think like there's always as long as there's that feeling to we can do better than what we've done before, or there's the ideas, and that's the most important thing. Like if you've got the song that you think people need to hear this, or the, I guess it's like a communication. Like I've got something really special here that I need to um, get out there. Uh, that's kind of more the most important thing, really, out of any of the money or popularity as long as that's kind of there then I'd like to think there's always going to be an outlet you know you're creative artists aren't you yeah. yeah I think like it's always what you're working on at the time you know like I'm thinking about the next next record and how it's going to pop out of speakers and how it, um, kind of thinking about everything differently you know mm. on this so um, would you consider producing other people's work um, if it, if I, um, if I really like the band, I mean, I look at Toby for example. I don't think after three Little Angels albums, he he would he thought of producing any, no, any other yeah. acts. No, no. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, to, I, I don't know. I don't know if if I, the first one we did was the first time Toby produced. Um, I remember Toby putting on social media, it would have been about 11 years ago now, saying I'm looking for a band to kind of take under my wing and produce. Oh really? That band, that band turned out to be you. Yeah. I think that we were, we shared a manager, the same manager at the time. Right. And I think that he saw us for the first time and he was managing Tobe and it was like this would be you know a perfect match right so we just worked out that was really exciting like um, first time that we'd spent in a residential yeah world class everything. studio yeah it was, everything was there totally fresh it was like the first sort of proper studio and, and you know um, it was brilliant you know they're, they're the sort of like exciting times really mm. um, hearing drums like sound like that for the first time was yeah it was amazing for me anyway um he was great. He was totally great. Though, too. Yeah, yeah, he is a really cool guy. He's a lovely guy. Yeah, yeah he's a... We're kind of, unless we're doing this in chronological order, we're now doing it in a reverse chronological yeah. order. We're going back. We're <laughs> going all over the place. Um, but, the, I mean, the first time I saw you, you were playing in a chalet in Butlins. Yeah, man. The Hard the Rock Hell Festival. That the show, were you at the chalet game? I took a video. I, the videos that are on YouTube oh of that word. show are my, my videos. I no took way. videos of that. Yeah. I went out of the, after that gig in the chalet. Like we drunk more than ever the night previous. And then I think we got up maybe half an hour before we yeah, had this gig. Yeah, you could tell. Yeah. So we did <laughs> yeah, the gig. Oh and then I went outside um, and was sick. You know, like hunched double... Uh, <laughs> Just like throwing it all up, and then there was this this woman like mid 
mid performance kind of like got and it's like can I take a photo with you can I take a photo you know honestly I am like I'm being sick and it's like just give me 30 seconds <laughs> yeah. it's unbelievable brilliant yeah the, yeah. the, 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 the guys who um, who Chalet it was gave us a bottle of this Mintu so it's always stuck with me it was like a menthol alcohol drink I think we drank the whole thing and it was just during the gig I just I don't know throughout yeah, the whole day because I remember we got absolutely smashed after that it was like well, we've got no gigs we'll get absolutely leathered um, and go and try I think we were trying to find um, what's his name from uh, the presenter from Art Attack oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Neil yeah. Buchanan I, 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 Neil Buchanan I had yeah. a photograph with, with him yeah we heard yeah. he was playing at yeah. the time we were like nah so he was like right we've got to go and try and find him so we were absolutely wasted found him had a photo with him and then I remember um, our agent came in and said, someone's pulled out of this gig and um, they want the best if you all do it. And I remember our manager was like, oh, you can do it, can't you? You can sober up. And we're all looking at each other, well gone, thinking, this isn't a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't and think then, it was a good idea. I think we had an hour to try and get sober. And, and you did the gig? Yeah, yeah we, we did, did the gig. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, I, I, was, I was there, but I can't remember. I, I can't remember. I, you know what, I was pissed that day, so I do remember... Yeah. Getting rat so that day as well. I think I just stood in a cold shower for like half yeah. an hour. So I remember minutes. UFO were headlining on that day, and I chased Phil Mogg down down the road after his gig, trying to get a photo <coughs> with him. That was quite embarrassing. But speaking to um, Van Crowbot, you know, yeah, yeah. mates, yeah, with them, um, and they played it, and they're talking about. <laughs> I, I was tripping with the after, I was the after party with them, and just how mad that kind of English yeah. Butlins carpet is. <laughs> and the oh, carpet right, yeah. going all kind of like <laughs> moving all over the place yeah. what's, what's the old he's left the band there but the old bass player Jake uh, Jake yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I was chatting to him well he was talking at me for about an hour afterwards he was absolutely off his face yeah they were saying yeah I've never I've never seen anyone like uh, I mean a whole band but yeah Jake like we did a tour with him in America and, <sighs> great gosh, band. I, don't, I don't know amazing yeah yeah, really, really wicked, really top guys as well. Like one, some of our best friends of, of everyone we've ever met. They're one of, yeah. one of the best ones. Yeah, lovely guys. Right, let's get back on track here. We're going to go <laughs> yeah. right back to the beginning um, from when you two were young. Did you both grow up in musical households? Uh, yes. I just did. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and no. I mean, Dad was a big Beatle fan, so I got uh, on that. He loved Elvis. I hated Elvis at the time. Right. Um, but Do you I like kinda, him now? Yeah, I've come him out, now. completely went full yeah. circle. I was the same as you. Um, but yeah, just used to be like, don't write his own songs, and it's just, you know, exactly. I'm not into it. And then I, you I get what I get. Yeah, I appreciate it. how great he is now. And then just sort of um, soul and Motown stuff, really. Um, I don't think, I don't really think there was any rock stuff, really. Maybe the Who was about, or early Who was about as rocky as it got. Was there no um, musical instruments in your house? Yeah, it's always guitars. Yeah. Um, my story's pretty mad actually. My dad always wanted to be a drummer and never got the chance as a kid. So I remember when I was like about seven, he bought me a full drum kit, you know, big pearl, like uh, five toms and for Christmas. And I couldn't even like, sitting on the stool, I couldn't even like uh, touch the drum pedal. So <clears throat> I never took to it. He sold the, sold the drum kit, bought another drum kit. I never took to that, sold it. And I just always wanted to play guitar, and he was, for some reason, he was like, no, you're not playing guitar, I wouldn't buy my lessons. And then I, I think I was about 13, just at school, and something must have just, a light bulb went off. So I went to him and said, um, I want to learn to play the drums. And he essentially told me to fuck off, um, <laughs> and just said, no, bought you all these drums. And and then he, let me, yeah, he let me have lessons, he bought me a drum kit that's like, you know, like one of them, um, you can't even tune them in, you get them from Argos or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Still got it, nitro yellow, and that's what I learnt on for like yeah. um, two years. And then he guess he realised right that's he does want to do this. Bought me drum kit, and Where that's that why kit? I'm a drummer. It's in it's in the garage. Yeah. So, good. but yeah, that's the that's the only reason. And do you still have your first guitar? Um, <laughs> no, I don't have my first guitar. I think it, I think I went through a um, trading in, you know, and improving. Yeah every Christmas time of thing so I, I didn't grow up in a house of um, no one played an instrument but my dad liked music 
is one of the biggest things in his life. So mm. um, I think it's like the Beatles and then Southern Rock of like the Almond Brothers and Leonard Skinner and then uh, Neil Young and Leonard Cohen. And then when I was going through school, got into uh, punk bands and um, I guess you can kind of hear that, all those bands into what kind of I write. You can kind of connect the dots. Yeah, absolutely. I guess. You say you're not originally from Macclesfield. Where, where I'm not uh, originally from uh, a village about eight miles away from Chester. It's called right. Ellsby, yeah. Right. Yeah, so right. Um, me and Dan met where uh, it was like a music course. Yeah, um, at Cheshire College. It was, which um, is sadly no longer there. <coughs> Three years, I think, it's been shut down. Right. It's kind of... Uh, yeah, Northwich, so I'd go, I mean, this course was really, really bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think they'd had loads of money put in by from the lottery or something, so they had a, the facilities were really good. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, bless him, like, the, the tutor, he was a really nice guy, and he was so enthusiastic at the start, and by the end, he'd gone completely grey. It was totally he demoralised. Was like, yeah, I think anyone could get in, so though, stressed. really. And anyone could get on that course if they said, I like music. And right. it was just, there was, yeah, there was the abilities there, were kind of from no ability to really good. And, uh, I mean, we passed our course, basically, certainly last year, it was just... At that point, we'd started deciding we were going to get a band together, so Al would just come and stay at mine in Matt for three days with her parents, and we'd just do recordings, and we'd pan the recordings, in, and that's how we passed our, our course. He was he didn't care. He was just like, yeah, just go and do it at your house. He had to. He had <laughs> yeah, his hands break down, I think. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It oh, was, yeah. I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He went crazy, didn't he, yeah. in the space of, like, two years. Yeah, yeah like, <laughs> Look, well really, really out. great. So then by the end, it's just like... Like swearing <laughs> like you could hear, swearing, it was just like, yeah, shit, this is bad, <laughs> yeah. He um, must have been getting so much crap yeah. off, off, off whoever, but... I yeah, ended up staying uh, at your house, didn't I? Kind of mo- probably living more at Danny's house with mm-hmm. his family, um, and then that's pretty much how we started the band, and um, I've kind of spent more time in Mac. Yeah, it was you know. a Mac, yeah, crazy course. I remember there was a tutor on there and he's like in front of everyone he was just like you've got it you might have it you've got it you, and it's like that was the head of is, art yeah what is that how do you do how do you, how do you pick that yeah brilliant. crazy <laughs> you might have it that, what does that mean no. um, when was <laughs> how old were you when you picked up your first guitar you can play piano as well right, right? So was, it, was it, it piano or guitar years um, actually I think that I said I wanted to learn keyboard when I was about seven, but that was kind of never went anywhere. I think I always wanted to play guitar, and when I was 11, I, I think there was a really beaten up thing growing up. I started learning on that, and then the teacher said, like, you know, it's a piece of shit. We can't, we can't go on with this. So I got this... Um, I, I don't know how long Dawson's music had been open for mm. back then, but there was like a little little combo amp with this, um, you know, Fender Strat copy, and uh, you got like a little thin lead and strap, and yeah. you know, the whole thing was about £170. Um, so that was the first thing that I got with... Uh, when I was 11. A, I strat, the best. a Strat's a good guitar to, to learn with, isn't it, though? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, there's got, nothing wrong with this the guitar. Ten, the tension on it is a lot easier to, to learn with. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, I think the best thing about the amp was it had like a little you know, distortion button. Yeah. And then you just play like the fifth kind of um, power chord yeah. and it just sounded amazing to you. you you'd have a like it ideas of grandeur from just playing like a, a fifth <laughs> chord you know like uh, reflection in the in the window <laughs> playing power chords yeah. yeah great can you remember what the first song was that you both wrote uh, it'd be in college wouldn't it like I, there'd be the music I think when yeah I'd never written lyrics before but um, was kind of pushed into doing that because there was no one really to to write them um, I think we had like a kind of 
I think the first gig we did, we did four songs, and it was like a blues song, a rock and roll song, a cover, which I can't remember what it would have been, and then, was it uh, a song called Getaway, which is sort of like the yeah. first kind of song where you could kind of see where we were going to start going with yeah. it, I guess. Um, but they were all like seven minutes long, like right. yeah, all the songs were always like six, seven, like the big massive instrumentals and stuff, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we made like a four song set last for like. He's like, do that bit, do that yeah. bit, you know, with the uh, with the ride symbol and the uh, you know like, to, like make kind of like four minutes of that, you know, oh, yeah. and then do that Pink Floyd bit that the you know and this song ends up being ten minutes long. It's great. Talking Pink Floyd, who obviously they they were an influence. That's not obvious really, but I've heard before that mm. Pink Floyd are an influence on you. Who else? I think like guitar right, playing um, Dave Gilmore, the way that he, he makes it sound, yeah, yeah. Um, and Peter Green, it's just that kind of touch. That, Peter um, Green for the blues and Dave yeah, Gilmore for it's, the soul. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's like a touch type of thing, but I think with Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon is just so um, tastefully produced, mm. and I think like growing up I always thought to make that sound you'd have to have loads of layers and instruments when it's really not like that it's just a really classy piece of work um, but yeah, there's always definitely... been a psychic you know a, a fondness of bringing in stuff that you wouldn't expect or to the shock elements so I think mm. a big part of our band is to play with dynamics to we start we started as a four piece and um, making it three you were um, you have to kind of bring bring the music down to then build up and really make an impact and give the impression that something's bigger or louder than it actually is. You know, it obviously helps that like Dan plays the drums like he does, but there's ways that you you, know, yeah. you set up a song to give the impression, make the parts stand out and lift, and then and you certainly do that. Yeah, Cheers, man. even even playing live, there's only three of you. Whatever venue I've seen you five times, something like that now, and small or large venues. I saw you at the parish in Huddersfield, which is a tiny room. That was great. And then place. I saw you. Was it? Was it at the Ritz or was it the Academy Two on the Divides Tour? I can't remember if it was the Ritz. Uh, I'm sure it was on the balcony, so it must have been the Ritz. Yeah, it would have been Ritz. Yeah. I saw you from the balcony, so it must have been the Ritz, um, which is a huge room. Yeah, um, it's, it's one of the things, it's one of the compliments that we've always had where people sort of say they make a map, they've got a big sound for just a three piece. I think, like Gil said, Dan hits the snare drum harder than, you know, harder as anyone. Um, obviously, he's worked with Dave Grohl, and um, so that's got to count for something, absolutely. hasn't it? You can, you, you've got yeah. to turn up to, uh, to play the, turn up as loud as the drummer. So yeah, man, I think, I think, yeah, for some reason, we all, when we were four piece, we always had trouble with bass players. So we just went through like five, six bass players, and in the end, it was like, you know what? And the guitar player at the time, he just blew in bass. But I guess you're suddenly missing that that other instrument. So I kind of feel like we all are like a subconsciously like trying to um, fill that void. Yeah. So, you know, um, I guess, yeah, I played louder, Al plays louder, bigger, and. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a, a natural progression, really. It'd be the same if we were just a two-piece. It's weird. You always think that it can be bigger than what, you know, I don't know what what you'd settle on, how big it has to be. But I think you've got it just about right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when Matt left the band, did you ever consider just doing a royal blood kind of thing and going out as a two-piece? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think as I say, when Matty left, there was so much other stuff going on, like... Um, you know the problem was with everything really and, and, and we'd been through you know we could sit here and spend hours telling you all the stories the stuff that happened to us that were in a bad way and it mm. enough to sort of uh, you know you get it round the head enough times eventually you kind of go do I keep wanting to get my head smacked and so I don't really think we didn't we, we, we were in that position where we didn't know if we were even going to carry on really um, how close were you to very not very very on? close yeah. yeah, I think it was. In fact, I think it was um, the first ever proper support tour we ever did was with a band called New Model Army. Yeah, love them. And it was amazing. You know, like um, 
it's one of the bands I'd never I'd never heard of I'd really? never totally missed that um, and then by the end of it we were all like the biggest fans of them they've got you know. mad a mad fan base incredible yeah. Yeah. yeah but they're amazing you know and like um, perfect band for us to first yeah. be with in, in you know looking back did you go down well with the new Metal Army fans I remember the first gig and we'd been on the we'd been we got smashed again and I remember feeling like definitely being at next to our life feeling really anxious like oh god you know like and um, ju- um, Justin come over um, to introduce himself and uh, and he was like I am you know and we were just like uh, uh, trying not to be sick and uh, and he said like oh fans you know they're kind of a one band one band kind of fans but you know after a couple of gigs they'll, they'll warm to you and it was like shit this is going to be tough <laughs> yeah but he was right, like it did. It, it, it felt like, because a lot of their fans came to loads of the gigs. Yeah. And it yeah. kind of felt like at first the they country, were. Really, that's true, actually, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. At first, it, the, the, I got the vibe and they were kind of like, who's this? Who's this band? And as it went on, we did win them over. And like some of them fans are still yeah. our biggest fans and come to all the gigs and stuff. But it, it was still that. Were the clogs at your gigs? Yeah, <laughs> mate, yeah, yeah. Not got the pyramid thing, though. No, on, that's but, a Yeah, yeah, mate. But, um, but that was it. And then. We got we got an offer. They just, they were doing a one off gig um, in London. They said that they asked us to come and support, and Matty had left, so it was like we can't really do it. Right. Um, but we really wanted to do that gig, you know, just to see him again and, and get to play the gig, and that was it. We had Ross. Ross had been doing uh, been doing uh, the, all the bass teching and, and touring with us through a year. He knew the song, so we just sort of said, "Do you want to do it, Ross?" And he was like, "Yeah." And then that was it. We did the gig. So that was the spark. To I, get you back up and running again, I think, I, I think so. I bet we. I think we probably would have had a massive break at that point, and that would have been a point where maybe we would have tried as a two piece, or we would have thought, well, maybe, or do we get more people in, or, or we have a big break. I think I was writing with maybe two piece in mind for a little bit, but um, I don't know. Stuff just seems to happen, doesn't it? Mm. And uh, things happen for I a think, reason. I think the idea that. Um, we were going to give it a break it's like do you know what let's just get this stuff out it took the pressure off and it helped you know what I mean like um, and just from just from doing that I think it it helped us make the album that we made you know with Northern Sun Sessions just thinking let's do the album that we we've always wanted to to make yeah and um, yeah probably the best thing that we ever did yeah, and it just happened by accident. Yeah, if, mate. If New Model Army hadn't got, in, got back in Justin, touch with you. Justin and the boys, they yeah. really want to just, on. Yeah, Justin's mate. one of the guys I want to get on my podcast. Because yeah, be he's amazing, a really man. interesting guy yeah, to talk to. I mean, the whole band were amazing, but yeah, the, getting to meet him and uh, getting to getting into New Model Army, you know, the, the, the tunes and they, that album that they, they, they were touring, um, you know, it's still... Still one of the one of the albums that I play yeah. non stop. Yeah. 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 Pipe, he's the Pipe Street, one of my all time favourite songs. Yeah, man. Well, there's there's loads of them. Just the integrity of the band, I think, you know, yeah. and they'd be doing well. You know, they'd be doing it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. they just always uh, they never they never sell out, they never um and when you speak to Justin who speaks to you like you could speak to anyone. I don't know. You just uh, they're all absolutely sound. And you just think, yeah. I think I remember me even saying that to me, like, um, we had a big problem back in the day because I said something about enemy and they didn't like it, and mm. you know they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, review us and stuff like yeah, that. And they it, liked but, having a strop the enemy, didn't they? At times, but that's that is him, and that's that's them, and that's the songs, and no compromise. Like Al said, you know, just never selling out. You know, awesome. Yeah. Thanks.
Going on to your first album, in fact, before your first album, when you released your first mini album, Cast the First Stone. We did a few, didn't we? Three yeah. EPs, I think. Yeah, yeah. You did, yeah. Um, so was that through a through a record label? Were you no. signed to Cooking Vinyl by then? No, no, that was... Um, it, it, it's, it's weird, actually. It all kind of happened really quickly. Um me, uh, we started playing with Matty at Christmas, and I think around February, um, we met our manager, and then through our manager, we met Toby, and it all kind of, it went really fast, and then it was kind of like very much like we need, what you need is, um, like Toby really like, loved the songs, he was like, you've got some great songs, you just need a really, really good recording, so then it was like we booked in to go um, to do Cast the First Stone. Did that uh, and then started picking up support tours, doing our own tours, and just just it kind of went on from there. And then the following year we did a, uh, just a ride EP, and then I think the following year after that we did another one, and then the and then King of Conflict come out. Um, but it was it was just it was all straight really through our manager then, My, our manager and Toby I suppose you know. How did you get your first manager? Is he the only manager you've had? No, no, we've had. Um, it basically it come about um, a guy that we a guy randomly in Mac um, found us and just was uh, he just said I want to get involved in the band um, not from the music industry I think the band are brilliant um, and he wanted to invest in it so mm. and we were kind of like great you know um, this is what we've this is what we've always wanted really because at that point we'd only ever played. Manchester and you know we were just a local band couldn't get any any, any further afield and where were you playing in Manchester kind of places Javers Clegg yeah. Uh, yeah. Roadhouse was open then I miss Javers Clegg yeah, yeah. And all, all, all them places all gone now Roadhouse we they are. Um, Night and Day Retro Bar Music Box um, yeah, Star and Garter yeah that was Star and Garter yeah yeah <laughs> um, yeah, so we did this, we did the same as like every band does, like constantly playing and not getting anywhere. Uh, this is in a different band, um, but then cool. we just have uh, uh, we play anything, wouldn't we? Yeah, we play anything anywhere for obviously for no money to nobody. Mm-hmm. You know, like 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 you do because yeah. you don't know you don't know how to how to get through the yeah. how to open the doors. I think we kind of like we got to a point where. We were listening to managers that were kind of part time from, you know, they had their own profession, but mm. not of the industry yeah. basically. And then in the end, I think you know we thought, "Fuck this, let's do our own album." And then we put all the money in, and did this album. It's kind of like rocking horse shit now. Yeah. Um, and this guy from Matt heard it and was like, "Wow, yeah, he was the, the biggest Oasis fan ever." And um, we'd managed to we'd made this album called Self Medication just just um, just with our own money against the will of like our manager at the time. He was kind of like, no, no, we're not going to do that. And we're going to sign this. You're going to sign this record label, and you're going to work with the guy who produced the first Radiohead album. It's like, yeah, but that's a shit album. Oh, so, you know what I mean? Um, it's my favourite Radiohead album. Really? Oh right, sorry mate. Yeah. It's only like I'm not two, a huge Radiohead fan. Yeah, I do like it's only that. two songs that I like of it. But um, I mean, anyway. So, but we we kind of lost. We were sort of disillusioned with him then, anyway, and we made our own album. We'd managed to get it in like the local uh, whatever it was then, Magpie or whatever you know, music store in Mac. Yeah. And he'd gone in and to buy the new album, the new Waste album, whichever one it was. I mean, I, you know, 
one of the ones that no one cares about. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he bought the first two. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, and he bought he bought the uh, he bought that album and he bought our album because he'd read about us in, in the Mac Express or whatever. And he just he found out where I lived, turned up at my house, knocked on my door, mum and dad's door, and I thought he was there for my sister. So like, my mum called me down and he was like, uh, I was like, oh yeah, no worries, I'll go and get her. So I called down there and said someone's there for you. My sister wasn't even in the house. And then he came into my room, he was like, no, I'm here for you. Uh, he was like, um, bought your album, bought Waste's album. Listened to the Waste album once and I can't stop listening to this album. What's going on with the band, blah, 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 blah. And he was really good, actually, because he managed to sort of get rid of this manager that was doing no good for us. Right. And, um, I don't know, cleared, just, I don't know, cleared the wood, really, and just wanted to invest. Um, and then, yeah. It literally really quickly after that we met what would be our manager then that was the we first time was at Jabba's Clegg wasn't it yeah where he just saw you play live at Jabba I think like we had a friend who like brought him down right do you know what I mean the time yeah. was right and we had like a coach was, load from Mac at the gig or whatever yeah. it was from that album that self medication album the, we met like these four guys that we'd just become their new favourite band mm. And they were kind of pushing us more than we were. I think one of them made a copy and sent it into like rock radio and Paul Anthony picked it up and made it like, I don't know, track of the week or something. And From there, it, one of them knew this guy. He got him to come to the gig at Jabez. And he'd said like, and he'd heard the album, the self-medication album, and I don't think he'd liked it or he was just like, and then he said, how many songs off there? And that set, you know, was in this. And we were like seven of them. So he's like, right, we're going to pretend that that album never got made, didn't exist, um, and then we're going to do a proper recording, and that's it, that's where I went from with Toby. So like that, that I mean that album now, when some bloke had one, had one of these self medication albums in, in Sheffield, the last thing, he was like, we, you know, he signed that, and I was like, can I have you had this from? Was it that guy's copy that that was on Facebook a couple of weeks ago? He, no, he he said, I said, where did you get it from? He said, eBay said how much? And he was like, 96 quid. I was like, seriously? I won't buy it. I won't pay, I won't, I won't pay 96 quid for like, I don't know, yeah. the rarest gym yet. Like, I just, <laughs> I, I, I haven't got 96 quid to, to spend on that. Yeah. 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 Um, it's amazing. Like, stuff like that is kind of, um, I think that's kind of why New Model Army seemed like a... Uh, a perfect band for us to start off with because we seem to have fans that um, just that hardcore mm. fans who are like they'll spend 200 quid I think like there's been as much as 200 quid on a self-medication copy uh, just the other day Dan got a tattoo with this guy on the west coast of America he's got like Dan's artwork um, with the heart with peace love truth music um, just loads and loads of tattoos, loads of fans that kind of follow us from everywhere and um, had a lot of messages, you know, since Northern Sun sessions of people that I've got no idea who, who they are, but just as a thanks for um, for doing what we do. Yeah. And that's the kind of um, shit that kind of, you know, makes it all, makes it all worthwhile, yeah. really. That, that's really, really special. Yeah, definitely. But you deserve it. You're two humble guys, very, very talented guys who create fantastic music. I don't want to blow smoke up your ass and then, <laughs> because you sat in front of me. Yeah, but, I guess it's like the way it we've never really got on with the mainstream. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like everyone's come on and thought like, wow, this band should be massive. And they've got these ideas of like, you know, world domination. But they never seem to be able to kind of market yeah, what, I mean, it, I mean, what it is, and I don't. I'd say looking back, that's the biggest regret in the last sort of five, six years that we've worked with people and listened to people that have tried to tried to make or push in a direction that we're not. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? There was a massive time where managers were trying to. We were getting loads of we were getting um, loads of good stuff from from rock outlets, and they were kind of like, "Oh, we don't really want to do that." And it was like, well, "Why not?" And it was like, well, we think that you could be rock and indie, so we want to try and push you more on the indie thing and ignore the rock. And it was kind of like, but if people say to me what kind of music I, I'll always say we're a rock band. Mm. I'm never going to go, oh, we're an indie band or yeah. a punk band. It's a, but you to can me, see we're a where rock there band. are indie elements in that. Yeah, yeah but I think I think, I think it was just I don't know. We we got pushed into a lot of things that actually, but it's not really us. You know what I mean? And um, I don't know. It, it kind of costs you and wastes a lot of time and stuff mm. and. 
Um, but it's all part of the learning process, isn't it? You yeah. know, going, going on your own, it's a big learning curve. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Which, I know you said nothing's perfect, but you, you all, it's you're not. getting a routine where you think, yeah, I'm happy with this. I like, you know, 10 years ago, um, I wouldn't have been spending days booking the cheapest European hotels <laughs> do you know what I mean and sourcing the van and the crew to go around Europe and then thinking about producing the next album and it's like um, it's a completely different place than it was when we started out like 10 years ago I know when we first signed with Cooking Vinyl they were all about oh you need to be doing this like and tweeting blah 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 and none of us had the um, had a smartphone. No. And it, no. Are you talking like six years ago, about five or six years ago? Um, that's, that's the... That's all I do. <coughs> so, I'll carry on. Uh, you're talking like five or six years ago where um, we were like, oh, you know, we're not... I don't know, we didn't have any kind of online presence. We didn't like address the fan like six years on. Um kind of talk directly on social medias and that and it, it's kind of what it's become really yeah. like um, if you're not doing that you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot really do you run all your social media we pretty much we pretty much do everything that you ever see uh, yeah. to do with this band yeah apart from book tours from this year yeah so like all the artwork and web design I do and that's kind of just... You've come, always done that, though, haven't you? Yeah, but that kind of come about from a necessity, really. I never really wanted to do it. Um, Have you always been artistic? Yeah, if I'm, all, all my brothers and sisters are artistic. But, you know, I was always trying to get other people to do it, get the managers to make other people do it, and then it just... We're just in that situation where if I didn't do it, no one was doing it, so... And, yeah, same with the social media stuff, you know. Me and Al just sort of... Um, because, you know, when we when we first sort of started, it was a completely... The social media wasn't as big as a, as it is now. Mm. Now it's like, to an extent, it's in some ways it's more important than Absolutely. anything else you're doing. Um, how you're perceived as a band rather than actually if you're a band. Um, I mean, as we were talking earlier on, back in the 80s, when I was in my formative years, the way I found out if a band was touring, you had to... Buy a magazine. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. see the soul being advertised. Picking the records and look at the walls, see who was, who, see who the tickets they were buying, they were selling at the time. Um, now you can wake up in the morning, two minutes later, you know exactly. Yeah, what no, it it does about. do my head in that like every every band that you you've never really heard of, and there's like a you just get bombarded with this promo video of them on a stage playing to about twenty thousand people. And then you click on them, and then they've only got like so many. Like, and I don't know. It's kind of smoke and mirrors where the maybe they've supported a band that or done one show yeah. where it's a, and you kind of led to believe all this stuff that's bullshit. Um, so kind of try and steer clear from that. I know, like last time, making a post of like you know we've got no idea what to expect with this tour because we've not been to a lot of these places. This before. is a European tour. Um, well, this was like the UK tour well, the we UK played like tour, half sorry. of them places we never played before right. um, but I know a lot of people kind of respected the fact that the honesty of rather than pretending that um, we're playing sold out shows every every day of the week I, don't, I think there's only so long you could keep that facade up for before you get exposed well, to look the like the further you go around the country the, the less people will know about the Virgin Mary but it's the same about every other band if you go up to Glasgow, Glasgow bands can sell out the Barrowlands, mm. which is 2,000 yeah. capacity, come down to Manchester and they're playing small clubs. Yeah. But it'd be the same with you, on If you you go down south, you'd be able to sell out the Ritz and then yeah. go, go down south and it's a lot less capacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I, I, I think I think the, the social media thing is just, it's this, there's two pros and cons with it. On one hand, it's amazing because bands, like you say... You can get um, you can get it out now. People can get your music and hear it. People can find out when you're playing and stuff, which is brilliant. And it's that's that's the good bit about it. Bad bit about it is kind of like back in the day. You know, if you wanted to hear about a band, you had to go to a shop, buy a CD, yeah. go and spend like ten quid, maybe even fifteen quid then, 
go home, listen to it once, and even if you didn't like it the first time, you're going to listen to it again and again because you just paid fifteen quid for it. Yeah. And all, all, and the minute you're hooked, that's it. You, you, you're in. You're sold. You know. So it's like, it's harder to get that now because it it's because it's so more accessible. That I, I, I've seen, I see people now. Um, and I, if I was sixteen again, I'd be doing it. But I see people at sixteen now that just go on Spotify players and literally, it's a new band that listens for like. Not even ten seconds, maybe five seconds. Is like no, next. Oh, yeah, so you got through like, your phone as well with yeah, like crap, such, crap speakers. Yeah, exactly. You got that's five seconds. To, point, yeah, though, five seconds to sell your band. As yeah. to why? Why should we listen to your your rock band over the next rock band? And that is such a good point. Yeah, man. It's, in it's, the old days, you have to you had to splash out your hard earned money so you listen mm. to that album. When oh, you man, yeah. that. I did it so many times there's so many yeah. bands that like if someone said do you like that band I'd be like oh I love that band but then I think like yeah, I don't, they're not one of my favourite bands but I love them because <clears throat> I've had to get into them you know yeah. because of that I was saying like to, uh, to Dan recently it was his birthday and it's like what, what do you buy for someone these days because like for 10 quid a month you've got every album that you could ever think of and then like yeah. everything can be sourced you know like clo- everyone's got everything do you know what I mean like you source everything for the cheapest online that you can get and I don't know do you guys have a look at your your hits on Spotify can you tell how many people have been listening to your records yeah but again we've only just started right. we've only that's probably only we've only just, the ball's only dropped on that for us about six months ago okay. so um, I had a friend actually he was talking to me yesterday about that's what he does for a living like marketing analytics and mm. stuff and he was like let me have a can I go on your, your website I just want to see what I can do can I help you out and I, you know it's great but like him trying to explain it to me is just like straight on way you. over my yeah it's just like I can I can I can tune in for 10 minutes and then afterwards it's like whoa like this is like mm. yeah can't well, yeah it's, it's, it's a learning process step by step we're kind of Get in there with it, you know. Why well, it's, it's like starting again. It is. It is. It's exactly like starting again. But you're not. Hopefully, you're not going to go away anytime soon. So another ten years down the down the road, you'll. Yeah, we masters. Oh yeah, exactly. That's what you want to do, mate? Like, you <laughs> yeah. Spotify. Let me have a look at your analytics. Coding, like yeah. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be getting coding apps calls. and stuff. Yeah. You'll be getting phone calls every five minutes to produce world class bands and. Yeah. I mean. Mm. I hope so. Or, or the way the music industry is going, it'll be something completely different mm-hmm. in ten years. That's like whatever the new thing is, you know. It's scary. It is, man. I was to ten years ago. It's scary to think how, how it's going to change again. And it's so unpredictable. I mean, uh, in I was saying to somebody, um, uh, well, I was in another uh, saying to somebody in an interview. In the last sort of four or five years, for all the bands that we've either come across touring with new bands or played with or seen them and so, some of these people I've, I've seen and gone like she's going to be massive like, yeah. like Stonewall got great songs the look if I was at manager it, it's easy it's a no brainer I'd probably say about 90% of them bands aren't even they're not even playing music anymore yeah. they're just gone and that's the scary thing yeah, it's it is. that unpredictable but there's a, a lot of, as you well know, because you've been doing it for 10 years, there's a lot of hard work involved. And if those people are oh, putting the hard work, yeah. I think like, yeah. they're just going to fall by the way. So. I, yeah, I think that's the thing. And everybody does it. You know, unless um, I always say the best advantage any new band has got is if they've got, sadly, if they've got like a manager or someone that knows the way around the music industry, knows that where you go, and immediately got a leg up on everyone else. But if you like us and like 90% of the other bands, you just think, oh, I really want to be in a band. I want to write my own tunes and I want people to like my music and have fans. That's it. Um, but actually, once you get into it, you, that's, that's not what it is at all. You know, like the, you, the realisation once you're in the industry and you sign lab, sign to deals and all that stuff, it completely changes, you know, and don't think you can be prepared for it and like you say I know loads of people that you know love playing the drums love playing guitar but once they learn the rest of it it's like it's not for me I'm out you know mm. I mean that's probably the reason why not is the reason why our friends Toby Jepsen and Rob Town have started Lightning in a Bottle yeah, yeah, to man. help to help bands or guide bands through the pitfalls of the music industry 
Oh yeah, totally, man. Um, I get it now. I just I see like um, starting out bands and stuff, and they're asking me advice, and like it's like nah, you know, don't do that. Like whether they're going through recording, it's like we'll be in charge. Of this, what do you think? It's like no, like it's just gonna rip, it's just another one of these guys mm. ripping you off. The whole industry. I mean, I don't know. Again, for every ten promoters, I think you only get one good one, and mm. that the rest of the nine are just in it for the cash. Yeah. I mean, there was a guy that used to promote all the big rock and indie bands in Manchester back in the day. And I saw an interview with him where it was like, what's your favourite bands? And it was like Britney Spears, Spice Girls. And he, seriously, was that's not joking. That's so He didn't like listen to rock it. music. Yeah. You know. Yeah, right. Going back, you'd finished King of Conflict. Um, you were going out on tour. And you got hooked up with Slash. Was that was on the King of Conflict so was it? Yeah, it was before. Yeah, was that it was before, before yeah. It was, was before. It? That was, um, I could remember our manager ringing us up and saying, um, uh, we've got, been offered these gigs, these three gigs. Well, no, it was, it was four gigs we got offered. Yeah. Um, I think it was Dublin, Belfast, Edinburgh and Manchester. And we were too late to make the first gig so we never got to do the Dublin one. Right. And we turned up in Belfast and apparently they'd, they'd done a gig in Italy and some fan had got on stage jumped on his back and broke one of his guitars so the minute we landed like a load of his security come over and was like you know don't approach the band don't approach Slash if he wants to speak to us so we just kind of figured oh that's it we're not going to yeah. get to meet him and that um, and then I think it was like two minutes before we were going to go on we were all outside having a cig and then this guy, this, li- this little guy, I'm sure he was short, and me and I'm sure, comes over like with a baseball back on the and he was like, you the bear? And it was him, it was like, fucking hell, Slash. It was, right. It just looked, wow. com- you know, completely different. Yeah. And he was just really nice, and then after the, after the next gig we saw him, he was like, you know, fucking great show. And then by the final one in Manchester, um, We'd heard that he'd asked for a t shirt, we're like, oh, no, nah. and then, yeah. He and there's a like, yeah. photograph of him with your t shirt on. Yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> man. He's on stage with it, like, uh, playing, and then you yeah. saw some, like, European uh, shows, and. Um, Miles Kennedy. Yeah, Miles Kennedy was wearing, was wearing it as well. Right. Yeah, it's mint. And then, really cool. Yeah, and for like years, people used to say, you photoshopped that, you photoshopped, yeah. and it was like, I don't even know how to use Photoshop. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was amazing, and then I, and then I think a few years later we saw like they did like a classic rock, free CD giveaway and slash his favorite twenty yeah. songs, and he put one of our tunes and he put by my bang, which is just insane. It was yeah. just like, wow. Yeah, it's sweet. It's like in between BB King and the Ramones, I think. So it's really? like crazy. Wow. Yeah. But what you know, him and the whole band were just fucking. So crazy. was it just you as main support? There were no other bands. Yeah, it's just, oh, it's it's just does, yeah. Do you Slash doesn't need local support, does he? No, no, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, like, I saw him when he was in Manchester a month ago, something like that, and he had Phil Campbell supporting. Oh, yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah, they're a great band. Yeah, man. Phil Campbell's band. Um, <coughs> we went down great. You know, like, uh, the first gig, Belfast, I can remember, like, yeah, we just sold all the T-shirts that we had and, you know, and all the CDs. All the, we didn't bring enough merch with us. It was right. rental. Um and it's kind of around that time that sort of we got, you know, Classic Rock Magazine did a thing on us and and then they, they've always sort of supported us and stuff. It was, like I say, that and New Model Army was sort of the beginning for us really in, in terms of learning, learning about touring and, you know, going yeah. further afield in Manchester. Just going off on a chronological tangent again now, but um, tying in with like Classic Rock, how do you find that mainstream media are treating you now you've gone on your own like how's the how's the, how's the um, to Northern Sun sessions by, by the, the big magazines Koran Classic Rock I think it's like it's probably more difficult because you don't have a team working you know with um, you know if I wanted to get hold of um, someone and maybe there's five other people that have connections to then it's mm. a lot easier than yeah. um, just me sending an email and then you don't hear anything back and then you know, you can't really bombard people without That's being they're, detrimental. They're updated, and, aren't they, with emails all the time? Yeah, I think it's cool. I mean, Classic Rock have always been really cool with us. 
really great. Yeah, good. Um, and Scott Rowley uh, gave it an incredible review. You know, on his um, on his own kind of social platform, which was really really cool. Um, but yeah, I think like Diva Rock as well. We've kind of gained. That's a great a magazine. Yeah, I gained I a fan in them as well. Yeah. I think like that we weren't as interested in the past couple of albums, but it's like. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird one. I'd say probably there's been more doors that were always closed to us that have been opened up from this album. But on the other hand, there has been some that we always would have got in that aren't picking up the phone to us now. Because yeah. it cause it is kind <coughs> of like where you you sort of against the you go in against the the, the club. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You, um, Don't learn. Yeah, well, it might, you know, like it, it, it might have to be that way because I don't. I think like more and more bands are going to have to start doing it mm. themselves. I think the yeah. reason why we can do what we're doing is because Danny does the the web stuff and the artwork, and um, you know, I'm learning all about the recording more, and we can actually produce, starting to mix, and I don't know, form our own industry really, and I think we've had to do that. Mm. Just because of the way things are, and I think more and more bands will probably start doing that. Yeah. Did you mix Northern Sun Sessions? No. Do you send that off? No, we send that off to a mate. Yeah. Um, but I'm starting to. That's what I'm spending my time doing really now. You know, learning more and more yeah. about. I mean, cast the first stone. You had Mike Fraser. Mike Fraser yeah, yeah, mixing it. He's, yeah. he's a legend. Yeah. That. I mean, that that come about from Tobe. Um, I think Tobe. He must have. He either produced or mixed one of the one of the um, Little Angel records, so he knew him. And then I guess we he sent the demos, and then he turned around and said, "I really love it." And um, we actually got to meet him at a Classic Rock Awards. Yeah, yeah. really nice yeah. guy. Yeah, but no, that again. I mean, you know, that was the first. I can still remember it. You know, when you're hearing it back, like Mike Fraser just sent the first song mix, and you you get to hear it back like that, and it's like, wow, this yeah. is like what I've always wanted to hear your music like like a real band you know what I mean it's um, it's cool you know I'll never get that again no, no. matter you know, no matter who mix our next yeah. record it'll just be kind of like mm, maybe that could be better but it's like the first know. time I mean I know you two are big United fans like the first time you'd have walked into Old Trafford that feeling you yeah get, yeah yeah totally pitch. you never get that feeling ever again no no because no, you, yeah, you just know what it is yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I yeah. think that's yeah. It's, it's one of the saddest things, really. Like the magic of recording, kind of, is gone. The further and further, the yeah. further down you get into it, you know. Because um, yeah, to, to us, when we had that, my friend, or to me anyway, it was like this is the best record ever. Yeah, you know, what I mean? <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, he was good. It's he, still he was, a great record now. Yeah, yeah. man, yeah. He, he did. He did. A, he did a really, really great job, man. Uh, I mean, I, um, obviously, I think there's about three songs off that EP that ended up on the. Uh, the, uh, the, yeah. the 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 first album King yeah. of Conflict but I'm pretty sure they got remixed didn't they yeah it was yeah. Chris Sheldon Chris Sheldon remixed them all so yeah man yeah well going on to after King of Conflict um, you then released Divides which um, it's, it's different isn't it the first the first it's very political Divides mm. Um, so when you write the lyrics for Divides, did you, did you were you in a different place than you were when you wrote? Um, yeah, yeah, different headspace. I think like the uh, the band as well was starting to like uh, no one was as happy. I don't think. I think the industry had pretty much worn us out, right. and uh, I think Matt was really not kind of happy with where he was. Do you know what I mean? It was the start of kind of. I oh, think he left the industry. So, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. I think like that album in particular. We'd done the King of Conflict album, we'd just been touring around America, and like you could feel it, there was loads of momentum coming. Um, we came back to do a UK tour, sold out all the shows. I think we did Academy 2, which was like 900 and sold out with like yeah. a month to go, and that was when it was like shit. Um, and we would, it would, at that point, we were talking about making the second record, and it took it took two years from that day before it found, before it came out. And looking back, them two years was the bit that really broke us mm. because it just the momentum went and um, yeah, the dynamic had changed, doesn't it? And uh, just thought everyone that. was exhausted, I think, and just like didn't have the spark really anymore. But why did it take so long and why two years? Um, I remember 
we had to. It was really complicated. I mean, this is this is why we sort of fell out with so many people. I think that um, it took ages to get this, this contract signed to um, the label in America because they wanted to make the record, um, and then we started. So let, let's say I think we got it signed around January, whatever year it was, and then in May we started making the record. We'd finished the record in September and the label um, we'd just gone with Spine Farm I think it was and I don't know who decided it but they decided it wasn't going to come out till the following May so it was weird because it was like we'd started making it in May and it didn't come out till May um, and yeah I don't know there's just so many that album as great as a, that album is and obviously getting to work with Gil I look back on it now and think it should have been it should have been a lot happier yeah um, I, I don't I don't have any rem- memories of like selling out the Ritz and stuff and I should do really it was just no it was just, it, was, it was just such a bad it was such a bad vibe at that great, point yeah. you know you could tell things were were ending in a lot of ways mm. um, so how did it come about you, was it through did you say you was working with Spine Farm yeah so, so um, did, it, did it come through Spine Farm that you worked with Gil no no um, we were kind of exclusively signed to Wind Up Records in New York yeah. and they licensed it out to um, to Spine Farm to Spine yeah. Farm but I mean Wind Up were incredible with us and it was pretty much who do you want to produce really yeah it was like Gil Nor yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah pretty much it was uh, is Gil now based in the States no no he's, uh, he's down he's south he is yeah, yeah, yeah when we first met him like he came to Mac to do all the pre-production it's mad to think Gil Norton stayed in Mac and doing like um, yeah so we did it in the studio in Trackside and uh, when he turned up I think I I just automatically thought he was going to be American and then he had this Liverpool accent yeah. and he was like shit <laughs> yeah because obviously all these a lot of the bands a lot of the big bands are yeah. American yeah and he said like oh, I always get that everybody thinks I'm American but um, yeah it, it come about from then like they just said to us go away and what, who do you want to work with and Gil was like the top of all of our list because of them albums that we loved yeah. the Foo Fighters and Pixies and stuff and um, he was the first one that came back straight away I think he got sent the demos and just said love it um, and then he, we had a conference call with him and he'd already made shit loads of notes on all the songs like he'd obviously he'd obviously really got into them yeah. so it was like a no brainer we had to yeah. work with him um, yeah yeah so he was a fan of the band then. Yeah, he loved so it. He like when he when well. he heard the stuff and he um, he kind of he moved a lot of stuff around to kind of work with us and um, cool. yeah, cut down the cost coming up here and staying in like a B and B. And he's an amazing guy, Gil. I really love him. Um, and I, I would have loved. I'd just love to um, go back to that time. There was just so much going on. Um, like we'd fallen out with um, people we were working with. And um, yeah. you know, just general unhappiness, really, where we didn't um, think everyone was just right. Gil's um, in control; he knows what he's doing. Just do everything that he says, type of thing, which is great. But um, maybe it just didn't have. Um, it was well, yeah. Looking back, there was such a great feeling when the first album came out, King of Conflict. You know, everything was so exciting, yeah. and it was like, wow, this is great. When the second album came out. It, I mean, it was it, it was sort of dead within six months. Really, it was over. Maybe even less than that. Well, they didn't have yeah, yeah. They didn't have the backing. Really, it wasn't being pushed. I actually preferred divides myself, um, taking a conflict. But um, I'd love to, I'd love to go back and do it again. Right. Yeah. Just there was just there's just a general sense. I think looking back that it was ending. Then it, even before that album came out, it kind of it felt like. There was no good feeling about the album going to do anything, I don't think, because it was just... I mean, I remember the, per, the, per, the press person we were using called a, called an emergency meeting because we hadn't heard anything that was going out and the album was coming out in two weeks and um, we sat down and the first thing they said was like, right, this is the official press release going out. It's like, the Virgin Mary's third album, Divide. And I was like, sorry, did you say the third album? She was like, yeah, the third album. It was like, second album. And she was like, no, it's your third album. And it was like, it's the second album. So like she thought Cast Festival was your first no, she, album. Basically, um, our manager 
that all the songs that we'd done on them three EPs that didn't make the first record, he just compiled it into one on iTunes and just put Virgin Mary, Virgin Mary. She looked at it. Yeah, she actually she got the iPad out and was like, look, King of Comp first album, there's your second album, and this one's your third. And I was like, no, that's just yeah. a comp. And then, but no shit, she just looked at me and was like, oh no, we know that, but we just wanted to acknowledge that you've done this body of work, but we know that this is the second album. And it was like... Yeah, it's backtracking. And at that point, we'd, we'd been told that The Sun had reviewed it, and Daily Men, and all these that were really good. And we kept asking, saying, oh, can you send... Can we have a look at the reviews? And she was like, oh, well, I've still not sent it yet. And you knew something was up. Sure enough, when we read it, it was like the Virgin Mary's third album. It had already yeah. gone out. You yeah. know what I mean? And I don't know, just <clears throat> stuff like that. It just got off on a bad... It's just a series of unfortunate events then, wasn't it, to, that led up to... Yeah, I don't think we had anyone really steering the ship like we did at the start. And people were falling out with each other and... Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think I think at that point, and then once Marty left, it was like we need to get out of all. We need to let all these deals run out, and we can start fresh again. And um, you know, we were we were being offered other deals. We've been offered other deals of, of, of uh, other labels, and we just said no because mm. I don't know it's some big name labels. Columbia we got offered, um, but we you know. We'd heard of another band that we knew that had, had, had an album to come out with them and it actually never even got released. Mm. And yeah, I think that would be the end of us. Yeah, if we'd Definitely have made another the record and then it never even came out, that would be... And then, and then we we'd can't. have to wait another two years to get out mm. of it. That would, have, that would have just destroyed everything. So I think the key is we can write a song um, and we, re- we can record it ourselves and we can have it out within yeah. a couple of months and there's yeah. no one to tell us like otherwise... And you don't get fed a load of bullshit that like um, timing is key and this is what we've got to do because there's like there's other bands that they've got to work with, you know, previous, you know, or um, I don't know. I, I know timing does does have a lot to do with it. And if you're working, I wouldn't say that we we should never work with a label again because it can be really important. It can be incredible when you're working together. Yeah. And um, but the deal has to be right. For you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think no it's point. point. It's the, people as well. yeah. the, the, the biggest thing I've learned and the biggest advice I give to any band is like, whatever offer you get, turn it down. There turn are some the some down. bands, some newer bands that are just taking the first deal that they are offered. And yeah. straight we, we away, did it. I can see. I can look at them and say you're doing the wrong thing. Yeah, and the the sad thing is, even if you tell them whatever you do, don't sign it, they're going to sign it probably yeah. because. The just alternative get, is get it on. Yeah, and the, alter- the alternative is they'll get back to the rehearsal room a month later and they'll and they'll fall out and be like, "We should have signed that deal." You know, everyone's got the, everyone still has that thing in their head of like, "We're in it to get a deal, deal." But no one even knows what a deal is. Mm. You know, you, 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 no concept. You yeah. think that signing a deal is going to take all. Someone's going to take your band and make it that, and that's not what it is at all. And also, it's like, you know, it'll be all right if we get the advance. But well, then you get, yeah, or you get an advance, like, say it was 20 grand, but you're already in debt by 50 to someone yeah. else, and then it just goes to... Straight to them, yeah. Yeah, man. It's like, like I said, uh, the advances these days, it's not the same as it was, it's, let's say, 80s, something no. like that. <laughs> but there's, there's not huge advances where you can live for a year. I think I was sounding this guy out that I uh, was speaking to who was really interested in the band, and he said that, um, I was asking the plan... And it was it was pretty much a, a six. I mean, the contract wouldn't be six months, but they would like work with us. They'd have us work with another producer. Um, they'd fund maybe like one tour. They see how it goes for six months, and that's it. So we we spend money kind of uh, making sure that the contracts would be right. We sign up for say three years, whatever it is. They work with us for like four or five months work out that it doesn't work and then we, we end up tied up yeah. you know for, yeah. it's just like bollocks and it, you wouldn't you don't see any money in that meantime anyway there's yeah, no point exactly. is there you might as well just stay at home and write in your bedroom there are there's there's some fantastic record labels out there absolutely there are, there are a couple that I think are doing harm to the industry because they're just snapping up every young band that are getting a bit of a buzz about them 
and those bands are never going to get any bigger. Yeah, because they think that like one of them, one out of twenty, will, uh, yeah. and that'll that'll work it that'll work out for the label. But for the other nineteen bands, it sucks. Yeah, there are some great bands out there that will never ever get any bigger because they're not the labels are snapping them up and not putting any money into them whatsoever. And it's uh, it's a sad state, but the, like I said, those bands are getting giddy thinking, wow, I've been we've been signed up. Yeah. Well, no, no, um, man. And like I said before, it's easy because every label knows if you offer a band a deal, nine times out of ten they're going to say yeah, because of what, because what, why, what, what, if they turn it down, they're going to regret it. Mm. Even though it could be the worst deal in the world, they're yeah. still going to sign it because it's what they think they're getting. They just think it's not going to. Well, you can be told that. anything though back then and be manipulated and bullied. Um, that this is the only way. And if you don't do this, then um, you know you won't have a career in the industry. And it's just because it's businessmen manipulating people who don't know to get what they want. Yeah, it's the same as any other industry. It's all about the songs. Yeah, but <laughs> it's, it's it to, uh... all about the songs. You have fantastic songs. You will more than life to make it if you keep going. Place with hard work. Like yeah. you say, you've seen. We've all seen. No, I think, you, I, think, that... I think you're absolutely spot on. I think it's just, it's just sadly, there's so many great bands that make that one bad mistake, and then that's it. It's over. You know, and it, like I say, I can think of so many that I've seen in the last five years that aren't even playing music anymore. Mm. They just they're, they're gone um, because they made the wrong sound with the wrong person, got the wrong manager, took the wrong advice. You know, but you're absolutely right. The best advice is. Write great songs and stick to stick to your own guns. Yeah, you know, that's which, lead, which leads us straight back to you again because you do write fantastic songs. Um, you've been over in the states a few times. First time was it with Shine Down? You got the uh, Shine Down so Was that the first time you were over there? No, no I think um, we we done like a four month tour, hadn't we? We we started with South by Southwest, and yeah, um, yeah. then we did a tour with I Am Dynamite, a really um, cool band. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had one a... year we did Book Cherry. Oh, well, Shine Down came way after that. And then Shine Down, yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah. really miss America, like touring around. It's so good. Right, so now you're doing things on your own. Is that a. Well, you need like 10 grand, wouldn't you, to even sort the visas out, get the flights with the excess baggage and then hire a van I think I think I yeah. think we'd have, expensive, yeah. we'd have to we'd probably have to work with somebody or sign it work with a label for that to happen I mean as it happens there's a guy that um, we absolutely love and he's one of the one of the few people that I've met over the years that I completely do trust mm. and he was really keen on um, working with us on Northern Sun um, and it just didn't it, it just time wise we wanted it to come out when it came out in September and I think he was sort of like I'll need more of a lead time but if it weren't for that we may well have worked with him so we may well you know maybe yeah. on the next record whatever that is going to be as you said earlier things just happen to things you. do just happen so, if you were uh... yeah never say never it could could happen tomorrow yeah I'd love to uh, I'd love to travel around the states again yeah, well, you're just about next week. You're setting off on a European tour. Yeah. Um, how, how many times have you toured Europe Not previously? Not that many. Again, yeah, I think I think again that's probably another thing that looking back on it was as great as it was. All the stuff that we did in America, um, we just sort of spread ourselves a bit too thin. So when we when we were, when we had the King of Conflict album, we'd done some European stuff and done UK, and it was sort of building. And then the American thing came along. Uh, since then I don't think we've ever been back to Europe really right. apart from maybe odd one or two gigs so this is the first one of this run of gigs on our own for like four years probably. I think it's probably the most extensive one in Germany that we've ever done so you don't know what to expect then really do you? no not at all no no what kind of what size venues are they don't even know absolutely no idea until you turn up and yeah, go oh right that's like how it is yeah um <laughs> Yeah, no, um, yeah, well, I guess we'll see, we'll guess yeah. we'll see, but I don't know, it's it's good that we're going back to Europe, I, I always thought that we'd we'd go down well in Europe. Absolutely, um, especially in Germany. Yeah, and then it just, it just stopped, um, we just never, we just never ended up going back there, um, so, 
Yeah, I don't know. We'll see, man. Yeah. We'll see. How long are you over there for? Four two, weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I yeah, what's, what's happening when you come back? Uh, I'm going to be, like, working on some um, alt versions of uh, Northern Sun sessions, I think, to kind of a different take on the songs just to get out for fans right, and, excellent is it going to be more like them the strips a little bit but right. um, not just acoustic I think like just to explain a strips was a group of songs that you did which was was it a double CD of King yeah. of the Conflict you had yeah, it onto yeah. the, like a special edition of King of the Conflict but it was all acoustic that's it yeah, yeah. so it's going to be a mix of kind of acoustic and um, you know a bit kind of remix uh, yeah. here and there I must admit, again, not not um, just because you sat here and not blowing smoke up your backsides, but I loved that strict album. Yeah. It, it worked so well. I think, saying to Al, really, it's, um, I think we got a lot of fans, a lot of new fans off that off that album because, yeah. it, because it was such a different take on the songs. So many people that were like, oh, they, they invested more in the songs because... The, it's like it's literally stripped back so you hear the lyrics a lot more clear mm. and I don't know it's just a lot it's a lot more simple to, to, yeah. to quickly get and I think we've got a lot of people there's loads of people now that still say like oh well that's my favourite album the stripped yeah. album and stuff I love the harmonies um, yeah and it's yeah, all you know Al did all of it on yeah. his own and it's it's great you know so uh, so yeah. kind of a bit like that for the Northern Sun Sessions and then you New style. We we kind of want we want to bring out something by the end of the year that's a a new tune. But um, just keep that momentum going there. Yeah, yeah, I think, man, so. yeah I think so. Like we'll be after this European. The, the first thing we'll be doing is getting in the studio and just like I said, working on that, working on some new tracks, um, and seeing where we get. You know, yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll put a new song out this year. Maybe we'll do an EP or maybe it'll be an album next year. Yeah. You know. Just see how it goes. Yeah. Are you gonna do any more people help the people dates? If yeah. I um, if I've got it in me, I certainly will. Yeah. Like Wait, I, just just explain what it was, people. Um Yeah, I did a tour. It was about five dates, was it? But I can't that remember how many dates and bread for the country, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I asked fans to set up um, a gig in their own town, and the ticket was a bag of um, food that was acceptable to food banks, you know, cans yeah. and basically non perishable. Yeah. Um, that was incredible, actually. I think we raised over about two and a half tons of, of food. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, we just we went around the country and ended it in. Um, Ireland actually it's that one I'm putting um, in Dublin um, and then the following year that was at Christmas the following year I did a single and raised three and a half thousand that's amazing yeah yeah that was just through donations as well through wasn't donations it? you didn't charge for the song no no through a uh, Manchester a great song as well charity no oh, thank you very much um, and I was thinking like it'd be great to keep it up at Christmas but with the Northern Sun sessions coming out in November um, I was just snowed under with stuff Yeah. so if I've got it in me I'd, I'd always want to help out and address yeah. um, giving, giving back or giving what I can certainly yeah when let's say you got two and a half tons of food for the food did you personally take them to food banks or um, did we did it so like with you uh, we got in touch with the local food bank did to they that. collect it yeah because you did it like in church halls and yeah anywhere halls and it was like the fan set, sets it up and they kind of become the promoter and I just turn up you know and do the do yeah. the gig it yeah. worked well it did yeah it's inspirational, absolutely. Thank you very much. Inspirational. So, great way to finish the interview. Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very mate, much thank for you. giving me your time. Anytime, mate. Anytime. Sunny Mac. Yeah, it's very sunny in Mate, you brought it. Yeah. You brought it. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be hammering it down when you leave. <laughs> yeah. Right, guys, thank you very much. Cheers, nice man.